Mario is one of the most recognizable brand mascots in the world. My film and sometimes video games and TV shows show has been on YouTube for more than six years and the longer it's around the more it evolves into a show about how the biggest and most influential art in the world is not birthed as a fully formed perfect entity. Mario exists because Nintendo bought and shipped too many damn radar scope arcade cabinets and they could just paint them uh, blue. A job 29-year-old Shigeru Miyamoto in his entry-level job at Nintendo used to do, a job his dad got him. What does it take to become one of the most widely recognized symbols of parallel childhood in the world? Mickey Mouse, Hello Kitty, Winnie the Pooh, kids have to pass you on to their kids. Being a generational mascot is a pretty huge deal to transcend language, entire cultures, families. If you take just his mainline series of games and not the 400,000 spinoffs with doctors and carts, Mario is still pushing 350 million units sold. There is not a lot of stuff in the entire game industry that comes close to that. Not even Scooter. Gotta hear how you do the catchphrase. Go on, do it. Catch a ride. <laughs> if you have heard the word video game, you have heard the word Mario. The journey to Icon is obviously not an overnight thing. It's extremely difficult and arduous. Mickey Mouse used to drive boats, y'all. Hello Kitty was a cute drawing Sanrio slapped on the side of a coin purse and people really reacted to that. No, no one knows, knows what, they're what they're doing. I mean, he's just a plumber that likes killing turtles. <gasps> may very well be at the top of many Christmas lists, electronic games being heralded by folks in the trade as this year's holiday bestseller. The year was 1980. Atari was on top of the world, recently purchased by Warner Communications. They now possessed extremely deep pockets. No one could compete, especially not Radar Scope. Hey! Atari was the 800-pound gorilla in the room to everyone. A new decade was dawning, but all of the designers at Nintendo were busy, and the company needed a game to solve the radar scope dilemma. Jesus Christ, what is that? Why does it sound like that? Anyway, there were a lot of these thrill rides sitting around, and it was opened up to the company. All of our designers are working on important stuff, so we need to figure out how to, you know, stick another motherboard in the radar scope cabinets. Or, you know, we could like, uh, what's the word? Cease to exist as a company. Okay, who's got an idea? Pause. Before we get to that, some notes about the game industry at the time. Nintendo was trying to build its own distribution network directly to arcades because selling through third parties would attract less than reputable salespeople. The Yakuza, bro! Also, this push to get arcade units to the states left Nintendo with 2,000 unsold units of very eh, radar scope in a warehouse in New Jersey. All of the designers at Nintendo were busy on their own projects, and this was a rush job, a band-aid. That is the radar scope dilemma. Unpause. Okay, who's got an idea? Shigeru Miyamoto submitted tons of ideas. Nintendo looked beyond his slacker burnout, get a job haircut, and thought his ideas sounded interesting. He had this one love triangle story idea, as all his ideas were narrative based when games still look like that. In fact, whatever idea they came up with needed to run on the equipment currently inside all of those wayward radar scope machines, which included needing to be a game designed for a single joystick and a single button running on all the guts and soundboards that were already in the cabinets. 
they gave Shigeru a, let's say, supervised shot at fixing this. To then President Hiroshi Yamauchi, the answer was clear. Love triangle, existing hardware, Hiroshi's idea, make a Popeye game because that feature film version was coming out in December of this year. The cross promotion would be huge and do a ton of marketing for free. <laughs> But it turns out you can't license a movie that quickly or in that way at all. Also, what did you know? Nintendo tried this because they thought they had an in here because all the way back in 1960, Nintendo was the manufacturer of Popeye ramen for a few years. So they thought maybe the ramen they made in the 60s meant they could co-brand with the Robert Alton feature film coming out in 1980. No one knows what they're doing. Shigeru knew the archetypes that Bluto, Olive Oil, and Popeye had could easily be transplanted to other characters that they did own. Big ideas. The villain would be the main character. Ooh, salacious. And without a Bluto anymore, and while thinking about barrel-chested rogues, Shigeru thought of a gorilla. Remembering King Kong scaling the Empire State Building, their villain would scale construction equipment. And they did know that they couldn't just use King Kong, but they also didn't really know, hey, it's the 80s. They did know IP rights were the reason that they didn't get Popeye. Hmm, stubborn. What's another word for stubborn? Shigeru thought to himself. Wait, donkeys are stubborn? And like that, Donkey Kong was born. Oh, and, and add a dude for like Popeye and olive oil or whatever. This character was named, uh, hang on, sorry. Uh, this character, Lady. She's a lady. Oh, oh, oh. I guess I didn't really need to look that up. And this boy looks weird. You can't even tell he has a mouth. He's like a gobstopper with feet. Let's just quickly give him a little mustache for a mouth. Give him a little hat, some overalls. Mm. Oh, and Jumpman was a carpenter, by the way, to make Mario's backstory even that much more confusing. From this moment on, we are improvising a new mission. And the engineers at Nintendo figured out how to Apollo 13 this jumpy jump boy game into these old arcade cabinets in New Jersey, where it was 107 degrees that August. They still needed a name that wasn't Jumpy Boy Jonathan Jump Jump. And while this is happening, the upset landlord who wanted his rent from the Nintendo hooligans hammering and jamming crap into these old arcade units was named, get ready for this, Mario Sagale. <laughs> Rather poetic, honestly. Mario was a uh, landlord. So anyway, that's how Mario was born and crammed into a few hundred old radar scope units. And like that, Donkey Kong was everywhere. Some months they sold more units than Radar Scope sold in its entire lifetime. Potential Donkey Kong kill screen if you want to watch. If anybody wants to see there's a Donkey Kong kill screen coming up. Donkey Kong made hundreds of millions of dollars. There was a Milton Bradley board game. By 1982 Donkey Kong was the king. A win all around but alas poor Popeye. Emotional fade out on the thematic conclusion of Mario's creation. Asian, Asian, Asian. But I'm actually not done yet. To quickly add an addendum that will deepen both Mario and Miyamoto lore in a meaningful way, it's important to look at the follow-up sequel, Donkey Kong Jr. Like Donkey Kong took over the universe, everyone was addicted to this game, and everyone everywhere just wanted more Donkey Kong. Video game sequel ground rule. Don't flip the script. Wait, 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 Cue Miyamoto flipping the script. Wow, Miyamoto, who has just accidentally reshaped an entire company, wanted to drive the story of Mario and Donkey Kong forward in a meaningful way. Donkey Kong Jr. flips the world upside down. Mario keeps Donkey Kong in a cage while his son fruitlessly tries to rescue him over and over again to no avail. Mario finally has a public-facing name, and simultaneously, he's the bad guy. Which brings us to 1983. 
Okay, buckle in because there's a lot of moving pieces to keep track of here. Let me paint you a dreadfully scorched landscape. It's 1983. Atari, the head boy, is sinking. The ColecoVision is not moving units. Milton Bradley's Vectrex is munching asphalt, so Hasbro seizes the opportunity to buy Milton Bradley and nope them right out of the console game. Mattel pulled in. Ah, beans! It's an Intellivision. And the sheer number of toy companies swimming in the pond should illustrate where video games in 1983 were and why retailers in America perceived them the way that they did. The bottom of the market dropped out and retailers were not very open to stocking hardware they'd never move. It's more the year of the Commodore 64 or the Apple II. Computers are for a more mature, sensible taste, but also for games. Computers were, however, not sold in a toy store. Anyway, are you ready for this to get weird? Too, Too bad. bad. In 1982, Nintendo released into arcades Popeye, a Shigeru Miyamoto-designed quasi-take on Donkey Kong starring Popeye, Olive Oil, and Bluto, which in 1983 would go on to be one of the three launch titles for the Nintendo Famicom in Japan. Popeye finally got his day, and Nintendo finally got that license. Confused? A helpful bit of background. Japan did not experience the video game crash of 1983 as America did, and sensibly branded it as the Atari Shock. As the read to them was not that video games were going anywhere, but more that America was kind of sick of the Atari and the promenade filled with imitators parading gimmicks of descending quality. Give up my Atari? My television? How about for this? You bet your asteroids. Also, E.T. shipped for the Atari in December of 1982. That wasn't so super good for the market. In 1983, in Japan, however, Nintendo launched their foray into home consoles, hoping to launch their own games there for experiences that were different from the arcades. The Nintendo Famicom. The first three games were Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye, all Shigeru Miyamoto designed games from the arcade. Hey, we all gotta start somewhere. Nintendo, at this time, still wants American products and a distribution network. They wanted international console business. In 85, Nintendo starts sniffing around American retailers and no one, absolutely no one in America thinks a video game console will take off again. Please take this next development to heart. Nintendo goes back to the drawing board and comes back to say, Yeah, but what if we added a gun and a robot? Where are you at now? And America is like, a gun you say. Which turned their heads and got the meetings but did not really budge the needle. Nintendo was going to need something bigger. Miyamoto has a small team working on projects for the arcade and Famicom as well. Arcades in America are actually still going strong despite the crater the birth of video game consoles made. The idea was to create an adventure that would capture people. Most of the games at this time have a black background and are extremely simple ports of arcade games. And the stench of Pac-Man on the Atari 2600 is still very much in the air. Miyamoto wanted to take players on an adventure. Blue skies, big worlds, sub-levels, secrets, things to discover everywhere. An entire world a plumber could just travel through all the pipes of to get around to all these cool locations. This is where Mario will truly begin. Mario is supposed to be us. Mario has had numerous jobs in the service industry, the average person who got to go on a grand adventure. And if the system's memory can afford the palette swap, his brother can come to. And he won't just have to look like Mario anymore. How do you look yourself in the mirror, Luigi? But there's one story from the development of Super Mario Brothers that I want to take a moment with. I think this story illustrates quite well why Miyamoto has attained the heights he has. This is how he chose to lead when developing this very new type of game and designing an entire world. Early on in development, the team tried to assign the jump button to the A button. They wanted a dedicated jump button to explore this very new and expansive world. Apropos of nothing, Donkey Kong only had one button and it jumped. Miyamoto was against a dedicated jump button. Button. He vehemently believed jump should be assigned to the up arrow on the D-pad. 
He pushed back against the entire team early on, and I get that perspective here. Designers just like having more buttons. You will never meet a game designer that's like, Damn, this awesome controller has the exact right amount of buttons for precisely what I want to do. But the team pushed back being like, My dude, this exploration game absolutely needs jump separate from movement. And that was against the dude that almost single-handedly saved their company like four years before that. I share this because I want you to understand the gravity of standing up to the guy that was somehow already video game Jesus. Shigeru Miyamoto backed down on potentially the most seismic game design decision in like the history of seismic game design decisions. I can't even imagine playing any Mario game where up is jump. Up is not jump. Oh, I get it. Absolutely no one knows what they're doing. We all make mistakes. The best of us learn from them. Back to Mario, where artists are working overtime to fit this thing into available memory. Art is reused everywhere. Clouds, plants, palette swaps. This was a very new experience to have of this fidelity in one's living room. The Famicom gained a 19 million unit market saturation in just Japan. A country of, at the time, 120 million people. That's one in six. Japan was ready for Mario and fully embraced the strange pipe boy. But America was busy dealing with the hangover of coming out of the video game crash, rubbing their eyes and being like, whoa, shit, Ultima 4, y'all see this? And here's where it gets wacky. Nintendo redesigned the look of their console into the Nintendo Entertainment System. They added a gun because America and a robot because toy stores and they still got nowhere. Basically no retailer wanted this system. They shipped a hundred thousand units of these to New Jersey again and then basically bribed retailers to carry them and did all the setup themselves. And that holiday season in 1985 in New York City, the Nintendo Entertainment System launched with kind of simpler games, we'll say. They only sold 50,000 units, so about half of what they shipped in the test market and not quite what Nintendo was hoping for. They needed a big splash in other markets. And then comes Los Angeles, Chicago, and San Francisco. For $130, you got two controllers, a Nintendo, and now ready for consumption on the home console market in America, Super Mario Brothers. And Mario made a huge monumental difference. As a result of LA, Chicago, and San Francisco, the system quickly opens up in markets everywhere. The NES goes on to sell 34 million units in the United States. Like Mario straight up revived the American video game console market after it was already agreeably deceased. Mario represents a lot more to video games than just a goofy plumber who dabbles in the finer points of Turtle Massacre. In an almost comically literal way, the modern video game market owes everything to Mario. He created the market that we know today. That's where Mario comes from. Nintendo did everything in their power to create a worldwide mascot for their brand of entertainment. This was a purposeful decision, a character so popular that it would move hardware off the shelves. That's the dream. A character that hopefully changed expectations of what a video game could be. A character they would literally stuff into everything they could. Miyamoto or not. Golf. Tennis, Wrecking Crew, these were all NES games that came out before Super Mario Brothers. This was a deeply considered move that just happened to team up with one of the cleverest creative minds the interactive entertainment space is ever going to see. Nintendo did it. They now possessed one of the most recognizable gaming mascots on Earth. They moved to mountains and accomplished the impossible. Comparatively, the next step is the easy part, just ride the wave. Wilder! Not yet. We all know where this is going, right?
Super Mario Brothers came out in America in the latter half of 1985. There's a lot going on at Nintendo, you know, having just sold tens of millions of copies of the hottest new video game on the hottest new console in the world, a sequel made sense, but Miyamoto is busy figuring out A, The Legend of Zelda, please see this video, and B, running his R&D team for the console they just launched, so part of his job is now high level strategy. Everyone is just really busy. There's not really an elegant way to give Mario the follow up he deserves so quickly. Miyamoto is off building technology for games that take better advantage of what the Nintendo Entertainment System slash Famicom can actually do. The decision is made to let Takashi Tezuka, who was the assistant director of Super Mario 1, make his own follow-up, which is technologically essentially video game DLC way before that was a concept. He was responsible for taking the Super Mario 1 engine and tools to lead a team to make a new series of super hard levels for people that wanted more Mario, and maybe add a few small features to turn some heads like a poison mushroom. Nah, nah, I'm a pop star, not a doctor. They trusted Takashi on this, and he delivered on the job as quickly as they could give the Mario Pros something to do, but also to turn the difficulty up to, uh, sorry, stupid. Super Mario Bros. 2, in Japan only, was released on June 3rd, 1986. It was reviewed for what it was, intensely more difficult Mario for whoever was in the mood for it. Of importance here was that Super Mario Bros. 2 was released for the Japan-only Famicom Disk system, which took advantage of the additional memory provided. The format allowed levels to be more complex and varied than the original Super Mario Bros. More memory means more enemy variety per level. Like bloopers in the sky, y'all. In fact, and this is a really weird fact, so I'll go ahead and just throw in a but did you know? Super Mario Bros. 2 was the highest selling disc system game with 2.5 million units sold. And that is important and is saying something because the number two best selling disc system game was The Legend of Zelda. I think the legacy of Super Mario 2 Japan goes deeper because of what it created, like ROM hack culture exists because of this game, Mario Maker culture exists because of this game, it all starts here. Which brings us to the eternal question that we desperately need answered. How does Lil Curbs exist? Here I throw this pow up to get a key from the thwomp, stop this thwomp from hitting the on off switch throw the spring up to launch the shell for later, shell jump, and then get speed from the shell I launched before. How? Okay, back on topic. Even though I'm sure all of you are just Googling low curbs now. <laughs> Anyway, there was not widespread confidence at Nintendo that releasing this game outside of Japan would see a widespread interest in something this insanely difficult. But important to remember here, it's not just difficulty. This is hard coupled with the fact that this was a Famicom disc system game taking advantage of additional memory and hardware. Budget wise, you also have to do this whole boatload of R&D on adding additional memory to the cartridge. This is not free to bring to America. Their decision to not release this outside of Japan made sense in the moment is all I am saying. And on the flip side, nestled deep within the recesses of huh? video game history, Grab a snack, a juice box, and a carpet square because this tale is gonna go places. Okay, so Kensuke Tanabe, uh, Eternal Darkness, Metroid Prime, and Super Mario RPG to list a scant number of credits so you Google this person. Kensuke is working on the research and development team for Shigeru Miyamoto R&D 4. They are working on a prototype for Mario where it's co-op and the characters can throw each other around to solve puzzles and get through levels. This prototype that they're working on is about a thousand years ahead of its time. I'm going to use a lot of footage from GTV Japan here, and I just want to call them out and link to their channel and video, because one, their explanation of this goes about a thousand times deeper than mine does, and two, it's just a good video that'll teach you a lot of stuff if you want to know more about this festival. Okay. Yume Kojo is a Japanese celebration of the world's diverse cultures dreamed up by Fuji Television in 1987 
as best as I can describe it in the mere seconds the attention spans on YouTube will allow, late 80s Eurovision but for all types of artists in Japan. 1987 was to be the inaugural year. There were mascots featured in advertisements and apparently even in blimp form. Also wearing masks is the thing associated with this festival because vaguely Italian. Look, this shit is all over the place. <laughs> Nintendo of Japan decides to participate in Yume Kojo and make a video game to commemorate its launch. Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic. Doki Doki is Japanese onomatopoeia for the sound a heart makes. Doki Doki. Listen, it's a game for a forgotten festival where you throw vegetables and stuff. What do you want from me? It sells a few hundred thousand copies, and it was directed by, get ready for this, Kensuke Tanabe. Hey, that's the guy from before. Miyamoto's building the crew, ya! Yeah. This game was made with the future of Super Mario technology in mind. The president and founder of newly formed Nintendo of America was Minoru Arakawa. He thought, we can throw Mario characters in and sell this game to Americans. And among other changes to development for America was to bring back Koji Kondo, the composer of the Super Mario series, to blow the doors off and do this game right. Which clearly, obviously did. Because Koji Kondo is incredible. Bob-Oms even make their first appearance to the Mario franchise in this game as well as other mainstays. Super Mario Bros. 2 sold an absolutely respectable 7 million copies in America and other territories. I mean, obviously that's a sneeze compared to the 40 million the first game sold, but for a modest investment Japanese Strange Arts Festival video game repackage, kept the lights on and accomplished its goals. Also, Peach can fly now, so that, what more do you need? Trick question, nothing. In conclusion, I think both Mario 2s are cool and respectable in their own ways, but neither really moved the needle the way the first game did. Mario 1 reshaped an industry and not Neither Mario 2 holds a candle to Mario 1 in terms of impact. If only all of these immensely talented creative forces could reunite for their PS Day resistance in Avengers like Team Up Glory. Well, it's funny you should mention that. Miyamoto was in a funk. He never had a sophomore slump before and wasn't really even responsible for this one. And he had also just made the decision to stay hands off for the sequel to The Legend of Zelda, handing off programming responsibilities to Kazuaki Morita. Miyamoto was dealing with the feelings of needing to oversee teams of all kinds of games. I think people that succeed as artists have some trouble transitioning to leadership roles in teams sometimes. He was experiencing what it's like at the top being responsible for the well-being of a company can be hard if you're used to making art and telling stories. Almost all of his colleagues had retired from video games. On the whole, game designers from the arcade era didn't make the jump to the new home console future. This was an isolating experience for him, understandably. And, to be frank, I don't believe he much cared for what came out of Super Mario Bros. 2. Mario is, by design, a blank slate that could do anything a game required, but Mario was Shigeru's baby. He knew if he was going to step back into the ring, Super Mario 3 would have to do what Mario 1 did and what Donkey Kong did, turn every head in the toy store. How distant Radar Scope felt from this moment. Alas, poor Popeye. So from the middle of the 80s, he built a team. Takashi Tezuka, Kensuke Tanabe, Koji Kondo, Toshihiko Nakago, Hideki Kono. With additional programming and level design support, he had a team, a strong team, a team he had worked with before. I think the experience of the Famicom and the NES probably felt like a hundred years at Nintendo. There was just so much going on the entire time. And this new idea was to send the Nintendo 8-bit era off right. Its days were waning. Sega was about to begin the 16-bit era in 1988 with the release of the Mega Drive in Japan. The North American Genesis version came out in America in January of 1989. 
and the dev team knew these dates were coming, the 16-bit era was upon them. Super Mario Bros. 3 was to be the swan song of the 8-bit era, it needed to be something special, a work of art. They built what I think they'd be imagining they'd be building the entire time they imagined these worlds for Mario. This huge world made up of smaller lands all carrying different themes. Desert, grass, giant, sky, water, snow, pipe maze, modern Mario, and all that comes with it is definitely born right here. And also the Koopa Kids. My god, the Koopa Kids are my favorite series of mini bosses in video game history. Lemme for life! Hey, shorty with the long text, I don't talk Sorry, that just came out. There's not really much to say here that hasn't been said on the internet millions of times before, so I'll just repeat the easy part. Mario 3 is probably the best video game sequel ever made for what it does. The memory controller chips that made Zelda possible in the States are working overtime here. There's so much in this game, there's secrets everywhere. Mario 3 is somehow simultaneously a game that raises the bar on the 8-bit era so high that it can never be touched again, but it also celebrates the entire catalog that came before it. It is the final note in the first act of video games at Nintendo. This era colossally changed the company and the industry. Game development changes completely upon the release of Super Mario Bros. 3. Super Nintendo and Genesis games are measured against Mario 3 upon their release. Sonic the Hedgehog was literally measured against Mario 3 in its first reviews, and some of them found it wanting, which is not a slam on Sonic or choosing a side in your psychotic video game blood feud. Mario casts a long shadow. I'd love to tell Sonic's story, or Chrono Triggers, or all kinds of video game stories in the future. Nintendo hit a grand slam, and the ball landed at Denny's. It sold 250,000 copies in Japan in just two days. Which might not sound like much nowadays, but this is the first sign of where game development and the game industry was going to go. They needed production in place to deal with their blockbuster future. The stage was set for the release in America. But production-wise, there was a problem brewing for the US release. Nintendo, at this point in time, needs a diversion. I want to go back to the beginning for a moment. I want to go back to Donkey Kong, specifically the legality of Donkey Kong. I sort of swept this aside before because I always knew I wanted to end with it. This story is both the beginning and the end, and it starts in 1982. Donkey Kong is already out, and Donkey Kong Jr. is in the process of coming out. Donkey Kong is on top of the world, making money hand over fist. Nintendo is shipping so many Donkey Kong cabinets that they need a much bigger warehouse from our man Sagale in Tukwila, Washington. Nintendo ends up deciding to also manufacture some of the parts they need in Redmond, Washington. They don't need to run an international business entirely from Japan. In fact, that's quite expensive. Nintendo was also at the time making licensing deals for Donkey Kong and including exclusive rights to put Donkey Kong on ColecoVision, a thing that did happen. Remember when Nintendo wasn't all that sure about needing the King Kong rights to publish Donkey Kong? Well, now that Nintendo has made a few hundred million dollars, Universal has helpfully developed an opinion on that subject. And hilariously, Universal revealed that they were suing to end all sales of Donkey Kong anything in a fake meeting Universal set up with Coleco to ambush everyone. Coleco agrees to pay a percentage of what they will make off the sale of Donkey Kong to Universal as a settlement. Nintendo, however, has been explosively growing, so this is a fight they might entertain. But there are, at this point, mixed opinions here. Enter Nintendo of America legend, retired Navy lieutenant, and ex-lawyer Howard Lincoln. He tells the company that they should fight this, but Nintendo of Japan is ready to pay a settlement because they just don't want the headache. Lincoln stands firm here, believing that being sued for 100% of Donkey Kong sales to a company that has never gone after any King Kong merchandise of any kind is a touch skeptical. 
Coleco even applies pressure to Nintendo to get them to settle with them. The only person standing in the way of this lawsuit is Howard Lincoln. Me, just let me know and a big challenge all over this case is Universal not answering demands to produce the document that says they own solely the rights to King Kong. Things get heated. Universal is handing out suits to everyone that has licensed Donkey Kong. Milton Bradley gets one for the board game. Many companies are settling, so Universal has already, at this point in 1982, produced a profit on a case that hasn't even started yet and where they didn't produce evidence that backed up their original claims. It's really just a bunch of people arguing and yelling in a boardroom, and some of them are paying percentages of their profits. Capitalism! The case eventually goes to court, and in that courtroom, Nintendo's counsel, John Kirby, proceeded through most of the trial as normal, providing evidence as to how Donkey Kong and King Kong are completely different characters, entities, and why this is an absurd claim Universal is making that has no merit. And then John Kirby dropped a tank on him. The original King Kong, released in 1933, was made by RKO Pictures. In 1975, Universal, buoying their own remake, sued RKO Pictures that they didn't own the rights to King Kong and that anyone could make King Kong movies. Universal argued and won in court that King Kong was in the public domain. Which, uh... Spoiler, that's not a great look for Universal. The judge tore into the film studio. They didn't even own the thing they were suing everyone for, and they knew that. But even if Universal did own it, Donkey Kong was still protected, as it is clearly parody. And this all actually goes on for years in appeals and other cases. Universal lost every single one of them. They ended up paying Nintendo millions in recouped legal fees. It's a strained relationship by any metric. Which brings us to The Wizard. I was seven when The Wizard came out, and as you can imagine, it was precisely my jam. And uh, where might we find this, Lucas? Nintendo Entertainment System games start to fade out a little bit on toy store shelves in America because of their production issues. There's a scarcity of resources to keep up with the intensely successful American Nintendo market. Super Mario Bros. 3, a finished game, needs a delay and a diversion so production can meet what will be a massive demand for all the different hardware that's inside of this cartridge. Nintendo is also having talks with movie studios about making and releasing a movie to hype this game up because Nintendo is sure this is the hottest video game since the last time they made the hottest video game. It is, curiously, Universal that reaches out with the most enticing offer. Hello, do you remember when we fraudulently sued you and everyone you work with? Oh, you're mad about that? They also came up with the idea to make it about video game competitions. They'll premiere Super Mario Bros. 3 at the end of the movie and the audience will go nuts. Super Mario Bros. 3! Hey Nintendo, we're not that company anymore. And Nintendo is like, we're in, which is an opportunity to flex, but it will also help them get production humming on copies of Mario 3 for launch. The deal made sense. Universal sold Nintendo on Tommy, but about video game competitions. I think what they got was a coming of age script in development hell about a group of kids that fight against the establishment and push back against their own parents for not meeting their needs and they hastily crammed a bunch of video game references in there. What is that? Power glove. I'm also totally okay with this. The result is kind of an adorable deconstruction of actual problems kids in 1989 experience intercut with a bunch of I got these power magazines to help Jimmy so we could teach him the secret tricks in each game. The wizard signals the end of this struggle Nintendo went on with Universal for a long, long time. 
from the beginning of this second video game era to the end of it, Super Mario Bros. 3 is the swan song. The band's all back for this one, one last ride. The wizard is the last lingering thing holding them back from achieving what Nintendo would inevitably become. Look at it this way. The most important cameo of the wizard, besides Bebe, Tobey Maguire, is King Kong. Maybe video games and the film business really can get along. Mario 3 was released into a fever in the United States. Not only did the movie do its job, the non-stop marketing campaign of all these kids yelling Mario! Mario! All over the world certainly set a tone. Mario 3 was a moment. It went on to sell just shy of 20 million copies. Cats out of the bag, an entire industry will grow out of this moment in time. People will grow up to have careers in the game industry because of this moment. A lot of smart people solved a lot of very difficult problems to bring games to the world. I don't want to forget that. Mario changed the world. Full stop. Mario shaped a lot of lives. The 80s was a tough time to grow up as a kid. Kids needed escape sometimes, and I know so, so many people know exactly what I'm talking about. I use the phrase, no one knows what they're doing a lot, and it's not to be flippant. If no one's ever done a thing before, then no one knows how to do it. The process of figuring out new things is messy, imperfect, trying, stressful, and terrifying. No one knows what they're doing because, of course they don't. But they still figured it out anyway. If you hear none of this episode, hear this part. Big companies don't change the world. People do. People like you and me. Gosh, there's probably a metaphor in there somewhere. <laughs>